Good morning on this Sunday, October 20th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. A surge of excitement in Georgia as early voters head to the polls. What do the numbers mean? We'll discuss. Seven new voting rules created by Georgia's controversial state election board are unconstitutional, so says a Fulton County Superior Court judge. And a Barrow County grand jury has indicted Colt Gray and his father for the mass shooting at Appalachie High School. Melita, Phil Theron, and Martha are all here. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. State elections officials say early voters are breaking records all across Georgia when it comes to turnout. More than 300,000 votes were cast on the first day of early voting Tuesday. That's 123% higher than the old record. Phil, let's start with you. Is there anything, anything at all that Republicans can glean from the numbers? Well, there's several things to uh, be looking at, and that is uh, the early vote has gotten through to the Republican voters and hopefully in the center politically too, because uh, uh, we're breaking records. Um, go to georgiavotes.com if you want to keep up with that on a daily basis on the early votes. Um, when you break it down racially, uh, you can see more white voters are doing this now, and of course, over 65 uh, uh, category does tend uh, strongly Republican. Uh, there are some um, uh, in the middle group, there, there's more votes there. So it's, I think it's tilting Republicans for now. Now, yes, we see this can change. It can change next week. Uh, surprisingly, in the 7th district, which is a, a black majority district, more whites are early voting. So um, uh, I know we'll be talking about polling later, but uh, the Republicans have succeeded where they didn't succeed last time. There, and Phil mentioned it, but let's talk about our favorite website, georgiavotes.com because the African-American turnout is about right now 28 percent. Where does that number need to land for you to feel comfortable with Vice President Harris's odds in Georgia? That number needs to stay right at about 27 to 28 percent. And Laura, you remember four years ago, um, you and I and Phil and Martha mm -hmm. and Melita, we all talked about how that, that number among black voters, if it stays within the high 20s, you know, closer to 30, that's a good sign for the campaign. But as I look at this number, I was very static with the early turnout numbers on the first day. Many of my friends who were black and Hispanic by the way, in Asia, we're like very proud. You know, you, you sense this sense of urgency. But then I told him, I said, guys, be calm because there's a lot more days left. And so while the percentages is going down, what I think is happening to Phil's point, Lori, I think it's just more white voters voting early. And one of the things that Martha reminded me of right before we started taping is I think less people are actually voting absentee. Mm -hmm. And Democrats had a robust strategy to utilize early voting, but we also utilized drop boxes four years ago, and we encouraged a lot of our voters to vote early. And so I I think that, look, this is going to be a high turnout election. Um, and I want to, you know, say this. The, the fact that these districts are voting early, now the ground games and the organization is coming to attack. Mm -hmm. Everyone who's been ID'd as a Democrat Republican, they're going. Like, for instance, Melita Easter is a super voter. I know she's going to the poll. But what about Theron Johnson or Martha Zoller, who's kind of wavering, maybe persuadable? This is hypothetical. I'm not saying I know, that. I know. You know, how do you get my vote? And that's why I think the tactics as far as the, um, the TV ads, the door knocking, uh, the persuasion campaign, and the data is going to be so important going into the final weeks. Well, I think, too, they're going to have a hard time time, what we're going to do when we look at this at the end is that how effective is TV advertising and where is it? Because people are watching it really differently and that group of people like 18 to 24 that they really wanted to get out because they lean left, um, they don't watch TV and they skip through the ads as soon as they can when they're watching something on their phones. So what is the impact there? Now I know there's a lot of people making money off those ads so they're hanging on for dear life to keep them in the mix, right? But uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that has because we've already seen the impact on polling, you know, because it's hard to reach people. It's really hard to well, reach people. I mean, I'm not 18 to 24 and I I'm getting texts from both parties, so that's You're one way. Me too. I, I guess I must be. We're women. For all of you say that I'm Republican or Democrat. Yeah. You made your mind up a long time. Well, we're I get women, it from both. We're women that live in a certain part of Atlanta. That's why we're getting it. Melita, I want to. You can talk about the votes, but I also want to talk about the Santa Center Advantage poll too. Well, first off, I, I think we need to make note of the fact that as people are watching the show at New Mission, um, at at the church in, in DeKalb County, Kamala Harris will be appearing and they'll be making a big souls to the polls push there. Mm -hmm. And the excitement is showing up in some surprising places. Um, at a Democratic County uh, meet the voter, uh, meet the candidate um, meeting in um, Gilmer County, you had 76 people. That was kind of like a record setting number for that earlier in the week. So people are excited about the election. I wonder about 
the validity of polling. I know that the insider advantage poll, but this is the time of year when Republican leaning firms are pushing polls out to influence the national averages. And I just am not sure about how valid an 800 person statewide poll is when most um, polls you prefer to see 1,000 or 1,200. Well, Phil, your poll, the Insider Advantage poll, had Trump at 49 percent, Harris at 47 percent. Um, just your thoughts on what Melita had to say about the validity of the polling. And um, I mean, Matt Towery has always been very accurate in his polling. Well, thank you for saying that. He has. In fact, he got the last one right, one of the few in the country. And if you look at the real clear politics average, which everybody should be looking at, that's an average of all the pollsters, liberal, conservative, in between. Let me say this. You, you aren't really a Republican or a Democrat pollster. You, if you want a good reputation, you got to just poll as accurately as you can. So I, I'm going to defend so-called Democrat or Republican pollsters there. They really, if they want a good reputation, they have to do it right. Um, I think that uh, Matt Towery has been, has been very careful. He's had it tied right up until a week yeah. ago. And he's seeing a movement that other pollsters are seeing, and, and that is that Trump uh, is up by two points in Georgia. There's very few undecideds uh, when, when they're in the point you were making. I think most people now in Georgia are baked in. And if you look at, uh, at the cross tabs, and everybody ought to be looking at cross tabs on these polls, which shows uh, the indicators, uh, I think you're seeing uh, more uh, veterans voting for uh, Republican Trump and more over 65 and also uh, younger voters seem to be for right now going for Trump. Darren, what about the, these polls? Because there does seem even nationwide and even what Phil had mentioned about real clear politics, there is a little bit of a bump for Trump right now, mm -hmm. a little bit of momentum. But man, the wind wind blows the other way and we can you know see an, a bump next week for, for Harris. Well, the thing that's been consistent is that if you look at all the polls, particularly in Georgia, both candidates have been within the margin of error. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it's and not so, over fifty percent. And not over fifty percent. So that's actually a good sign for the Harris Walls campaign because we've seen the number of, of resources that have been dumped into Georgia for Trump to defend. But one of the things that I wanted to, to sort of talk about in polling and in, in, in the inside advantage, but I do agree with Malita. I think the sample size can be bigger. Uh, Eight hundred is not a reflective number of the state. It's not unusual. It's not unusual, but I think it could be bigger because I think it gives a better confidence level of actually are you getting the people. But just to point out some real quick, Laura, you know I'm back to doing this. Stating facts, you know, Trump was at 22 percent among black voters about two months ago, and I want to call it a false flag amongst black voters, in particular black men. Uh, New York Times is now reporting that that number is down to 12. Uh, CBS is reporting that that number is down now to 12 percent. Uh, uh, sorry, New York Times is reporting it's down to 15. CBS is reporting it's down to 12. So as we've been predicting, a lot of these black voters Titan. are coming home. And so Cordell Belcher is a person who is on national TV. He's on Meet the Press a lot. I talked to him this weekend, and it's back to what Melita Anfield was saying: is that you're going to see both both campaigns push out polling. You're going to see national polling pushed out. But ultimately, I think that there's not a lot of undecided people left. Is can you get them excited about going to vote for this election? Because either you vote or you sit on the couch. Right. But the big concern is among pollsters across the board is that these undecideds are not actually going to vote. Right. Okay, that if you're undecided at this point with an election that's had as much noise around it as this one has, that you may just decide, you know, a pox on all their houses. And, you know, that could be what happens. Frank Luntz and others have commented on that. Well, Phil, back here in Georgia, some folks may be surprised at some of the questions on the ballot, <laughs> right? Here we go again. What are folks deciding? Because once again, we see a lot of legal jargon. Right, exactly. You got to be careful reading this jargon. I, I thought we passed a law years ago to make it in plain English at the eighth grade level, but uh, we didn't do that apparently. Um, they're all tax related. There's three amendments on the ballot. Uh, number one, and I'm, I'm in favor personally of all, I'm going to vote yes, although right now the no's are winning, but uh, there's a, an amendment that curbs the property tax hikes through a, a statewide homestead exemption. And uh, there are, it's a tax break for your primary residents. And so it caps the tax increases so it doesn't outpace uh, Biden-Harris inflation. And also, uh, I thought I'd slip that in I love that. But, I love um, it. But, um, uh, <laughs> That's secondly, not on the ballot. <laughs> secondly, <laughs> <not> on the <laughs> secondly um, uh, Georgia's creating tax courts that uh, are going to do tax di disputes, and it's just shifting something from the executive branch to the, to the judicial branch, which I think is good. And uh, finally, there's a big referendum, and it, um, uh, it says uh, increases in a property tax exemption for tangible personal property worth $750 uh, $7, or less. And um, 
you can't uh, deduct your car or anything like that. Uh, anyhow, so okay. I think it's all good. All right, we'll leave it there. Up next, a Fulton County Superior Court judge says new election rules in Georgia are unconstitutional. Some Republicans are now appealing that decision. We'll discuss next. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. National and state Republicans are appealing a judge's ruling that said seven election rules recently passed by Georgia's state election board are illegal, unconstitutional, and void. The rules that Fulton County Superior Court Judge Thomas Cox invalidated include three that have gotten a lot of attention. One that requires the number of ballots be hand counted after the close of polls, and two that had to do with the certification of election results. Melita, we're just a couple of weeks out from election day and we're still fighting over these rules. Yes, and you almost need a spreadsheet because you've got more than half a dozen lawsuits filed. You've got judges in different jurisdictions all issuing opinions, sometimes on the same parts of the law that, that, that these um, elections board members have passed. And so Judge Cox turned out a lot of these rules in an 11-page opinion on Wednesday, which was issued a scant two hours after the hearing concluded. And then on Tuesday, Judge McBurney had blocked new rules requiring the hand count of ballots. And he affirmed the fact that election results certifying them is mandatory. And Judge McBurney's opinion is well worth reading. He he must make his former English teachers proud with his vocabulary and his references to popular culture. He was even referring to Lord of the Rings and the way he <laughs> issued the opinion. So, um, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens, though, if some of these judges disagree with each other. Look, I said from the beginning of this, I thought it was too late to make changes in the rules back when they were taking them up in September. So, you know, even though I don't agree with all the Lord of the Rings analogies, I do agree that it was too late to be putting new rules in. All right. Well, moving on, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis is requesting that the Georgia Court of Appeals restore six of her original criminal counts against former President Trump and his co-defendants in the 2020 election interference case. Phil. Well, as uh, the debate has raged over these, uh, this prosecution by Willis, um, prominent, you've heard me say this before on the show, prominent Democrats, prominent Republican trial attorneys have said uh, it was just a uh, throw this mud against the wall, see if it sticks, because they're using the state um, anti-racketeering law, which was never intended for something like this. And so uh, I think the judge did the right thing throwing this out. I think he should have thrown everything out. It never you never should have a, a local prosecutor going after a president or former president. If you want to do this, I've always said, and a lot of, a lot of these lawyers have said that they're federal charges if, if you want to do that. So I don't see this going anywhere. Darren? You know, I think the thing here is about fairness and it's about the future. You know, if you had people who were anti-democracy actors, people who literally were spreading rumors that were not true, trying to disrupt the election, uh, they denied the election results, you know, the district attorney has an oath of responsibility to make sure that she carries out what she intended to do. There was clearly a, an indictment that was put down for these 19 co-defendants. Uh, one of them, you know, sort of um, very early decided to take a plea. And so I think that it's really left up to her and to communicate to the public, okay, where we are in the case. And I don't see her giving up and going away. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the judge was right or wrong. I just think that she has a judicial responsibility to do her job as prosecutor. And real quick, if I could do this, I think Thomas Cox made the right decision. I know I didn't get a chance to talk about that he's a good man and also McBurney but we knew from the start that these election board members were wrong and they were all they were trying to do is inject political uh, outcomes into a, a process so call let, let me let me let me make just a quick, quick comment on, on judge Cox um, I think he got it wrong um, yep. half of my lawyer friends uh, like the Cox ruling and the other half of my lawyer friends didn't I'm from what my friends are for but anyhow um, I think that he was wrong-headed because last cycle Raffensperger did all these last-minute rulemaking. Nobody said anything. <coughs> I think Look, he got call it wrong. Me, call, me Martha. call me cynical, but Fonnie Willis is doing this so that it'll be in the news as early voting is starting, and she is also doing it to cover up the fact that her boyfriend is testifying. So this is all political. This has nothing to do with the case having any merits. All right, well, let's talk about former Fulton County Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade because he left Capitol Hill on Tuesday after a marathon four-and-a-half-hour grilling by House Judiciary Committee investigators. Wade, whose legal team included, there you see it, former Governor, George, uh, Governor Roy Barnes. Well, he said little to reporters before, after, and during the closed-door deposition. Barnes told reporters after the meeting, we gave our testimony, we cooperated, 
and we are through. Melita? Well, he had a little bit more to say in a letter to Jim Jordan. But. Yes, he did. He did. <laughs> that, that letter he wrote to Jim Jordan before this testimony um, at the end of September was a classic, classic master class in how to write smart, sassy, southern shade. It was classic Roy Barnes. It was very classic <laughs> Roy Barnes. He suggested that Jim Jordan needed an anger management class. He quoted scripture. He quoted southern um, sayings and, and he basically said, when you've taken the anger management class, we'll talk in a, in a <laughs> logical way. Bill, what do you think about this four and a half hour grilling? Well, it was necessary because uh, we're dealing with lawfare, and this has been a problem now in the, in the whole legal realm of our country, and it's sad to see. I hope this can go away, but I don't think it will. Uh, you saw um, with this hearing how um, Wade and, and Willis uh, had this political prosecution. They were coordinating. What they're looking for in the hearing was the emails, the coordination with the Biden-Harris White House. It's a disgrace. It never should have happened. Darren, and that's what exposed it. Final word on that. I think there's two things that are true in this Nathan Way situation. One, it was an inappropriate relationship that he had with District Attorney Fonda Willis. Everyone has said that, including themselves. But also, his relationship with the District Attorney has no merit on this case. And so until you can produce evidence that there was an inappropriate relationship, uh, that yes, that happened, but did his relationship with her have negative merits on the case? And I think that that's what Roy Barnes is basically saying. You know, you have to prove to the public about uh, well, what did the relationship that he had, how did it impact the case? And this is an ongoing case as we still take today. And one of the reporters had asked former Governor Barnes, you know, did he plead the Fifth Amendment? And Governor Barnes said, what's the crime? You know, exactly. Was no you got to prove how did what are, what are the merits of his relationship and did it affect the case? It's I mean, the appearance of the conflict of interest. Well, Even the well, judge we, reprimanded. Uh, appearances are never a crime. We'll leave it there. Up next, Colt Gray and his father face dozens of charges in the Appalachia High School shooting. We'll discuss next. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. A grand jury has indicted 14-year-old Colt Gray and his father in the Appalachia High School shooting. The teen faces 55 charges related to the shooting. His dad faces 29 charges. Investigators say there were several warning signs just ignored by Colt Gray's father, uh, Martha. I think that is what is just so disturbing. I mean, he had a shrine to school shooters like behind his computer. There were warning signs, and yet that father allegedly gave his son a gun. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was the right thing to do, and I think we're going to see more of this as, as time goes on, and I think it is the right thing to do. And then the other part of it is, what do you, you know, we've got to do a better job. Evidently, the mother the mother was trying to get help for their child. There's still a lot of barriers to people getting the help they need. So parents need to call attention, but they need to have some place to call it attention to, right, and be able to get the services. So I'm happy with what the court has done, and, you know, we'll watch this case closely. Darren, this clearly sends a message. It does, and, and I want to say this, you know, again, offering my condolences to the family of the victim. Um, there are still high school students who are dealing with this traumatic experience mm -hmm. of going back to school. But, uh, you know, I've talked to a few state Republican leaders who represent that area, and they're very, you know, concerned. A lot of them have talked to the parents, and I want to commend them uh, for reaching out. But holding the grays to justice, you know, bringing justice to this process and holding them accountable is just one step. Yes. We still, in this state, and I want to compliment Speaker Burns for taking the efforts to basically say, hey, we're going to do something different. But we had a legislative session that's coming up. So, Laura, I would hope that this is the first step towards justice, holding them accountable. And you mentioned the family. You've got to give them resources to report uh, this type of behavior. And, yes, mental illness is a part of it. But the buck doesn't stop now. You've got to go further. We've got to have a very uncomfortable conversation in this state about responsible gun ownership coupled with mental illness. And what can state and local and federal <laughs> leaders do to deal with this crisis that we're having all across the country. We'll be watching and discussing that issue. State leaders are reporting $6 billion and counting. That's the tally so far in losses to Georgia's agricultural industry after Hurricane Helene, Phil. Well, uh, it's shocking. I mean, when you look at, uh, we were talking with uh, Tyler Harper the other day for an interview with James Magazine, and this could go up to over $9 billion. And, and Melita, you and I talked in a show previously how the agriculture industry has just taken a horrible hit. Um, I was over in Augusta the other day, and uh, I was shocked. We've talked about that, too. Um, but um, 
I think that it's going to take years for the agriculture industry, our number one industry, to recover. And Melita, I bring this up because you know we're so Atlanta centric, but you know we're thinking about our friends from Valdosta to you know the whole eastern part of Georgia, and I don't want to forget them because there's still so much damage and there's still so much to do. Absolutely, and the thing is, this damage estimate, even though it might be low, as Phil said, is three times the 2019. Um, damages from Michael and and it's also reflective of the fact that so many of the crops are not just one-year row crops but they're pecan trees they're blueberry bushes they're olive trees in North Georgia you have a growing winery industry and so the crop damage for a row crop like peanuts can be recovered in one year but a pecan orchard takes about eight years mm -hmm. to restore to um, bearing fruit productively. So it's it's really dramatic what, what those farmers are experiencing. All right, well, let's end this block on a high note. It's official because Atlanta will host the Super Bowl in 2028, Theron. That's such great news. Do you, great did news. Did you get your email about tickets? I did, I did. <laughs> and um, look, That's I mean, crazy. this is a this was a group effort, you know, first and foremost led by Mayor Andre Dickens. You know, I know that um, Dan Corso over there, the Sports Council was very involved. Both chambers uh, were involved. I know the state had a lot of impact as well. I know the governor came out and, and celebrated it. So this is when, you know, you look at how Arthur Blank, we got to give him credit mm -hmm. to, building this state-of-the-art um, facility, this this great uh, football stadium that a lot of, you know, it didn't get built without controversy, but it makes Atlanta attractive. But one of the things that I was very happy to city, the city say is that, hey, before we get to the Super Bowl, you know, we got the World Cup yes. coming up. And that's equivalent of eight Super Bowl and mm -hmm. so when I hear things like they're already preparing, getting supplies on hand to make sure we improve the infrastructure, a lot of that federal money that's coming down, uh, coordinating with the congressional delegation, making sure that local municipalities, other counties are all together and planning for the World Cup, I think that would be a good test run. But ultimately, look, it's going to be great for our economy. Uh, I hope that the Falcons will be playing in that Super Bowl. <laughs> and the Steelers. Um, <laughs> I <did also. laughs> Martha, but this is exciting. I mean, you got the World Cup in 2026, then you turn around and there's the Super Bowl. And other yeah. And I'm Other a little events. superstitious, so I really don't want the Falcons to play in it <laughs> because they played in it the last time it was here and it was not good. But um, I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be fantastic. And Georgia Georgia Tech is going to be playing at uh, Mercedes-Benz. I think next year is what they said. They announced that it's going to be there the first time they've ever had it in a big ben big venue like that. So it brings a lot in there, and I can't wait for the World Cup. I think it's going to be fantastic. I do too. Phil? Well, I agree with what my colleagues are saying, and uh, it's going to be great, obviously, for Atlanta and the state. And I I think uh, our tourism industry will really uh, be boosted. I know William Pate with the Convention and Visitors Bureau yes. is celebrating yes. and uh, it'll be great for that. All right, we'll leave it there. Coming up, winners and losers, stay tuned. Time now for the week's winners and losers. Okay, Martha, we'll start with you. So I have to correct <laughs> that the Falcons did not play in Atlanta when they lost against the Patriots, so I hope they will be there okay, <laughs> when it goes. I want to make a winner. Uh, Polk County, uh, they have started their own sheriff's department for their school system, and that way they have a sheriff, they have deputies, they have people that are committed only to school safety. Pretty cool idea. I'm sharing it with the rest of the state. Also, I've got all winners this week. I'm in a good mood. Georgia, voting fantastic I'm so excited every day the numbers I've seen Brian Kemp with this amazing surplus that is really showing that the state is ready to go and then Leah Aldridge uh, from a group women lead right they are going and getting those persuadable women and Republican voters and getting them out to the polls Farron I agree with Martha definitely huge winners this week are all the poll workers uh, the election divisions that did a pretty good job not a pretty good job a great, great job, job of making sure that everything was uh, flowing so shout out to you all also want to make Clark Atlanta University a winner this week it's our homecoming week, and so you'll so feel we have a nice homecoming over there. Um, it's going to be a lot of eating and drinking, but more importantly, we're celebrating our football team. I haven't talked about Clark Atlanta University's football team. It's only lost one game this year wow. and one tie, but we actually should be um, – that tie should actually we would have won, but it was canceled due to weather. And then lastly, just want to make sure that everyone um, gets out and vote. I mean, I think this election is so important, and so just want to make all the people who've already voted a winner. Good. 
Phil. Oh, all the people that voted aren't winners. And that's exactly <laughs> right. I am um, going to go over to Cobb County for a terrible loser, Sheriff Craig Owens. He went over. He went over to uh, get a, a whopper and uh, at Burger King. <laughs> at Burger King, and they messed up his order. He flew into a rage. Uh, three of his deputies were ordered to come in with sirens blaring, and uh, he demanded to know who that was, the owner there, and uh, it's an outrage, it's an abuse of office. If he wants to complain, complain uh, like everybody else. What a what a disgrace. By the way, my winner, I hope, is David Cavender. He's a better candidate over in Cobb County for sheriff. Loser, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Remember her? She used to be mayor of Atlanta, now advising um, Kamala Harris. Good grief. She's the one that destroyed our police department in Atlanta. All right, Melita. Well, my winner of the week is Mayor Andre Dickens, not only because he was his most charming and charismatic during a winless fundraiser on Monday evening at the lovely home of Senator Sonia Halpern, but because after a two-year ban on redevelopment, the city has announced what sound like some exciting plans for a mixed-use development on the 22-acre Atlanta Medical Center site in the Old Fourth Ward, which has been um, vacant since the um, hospital closed two years ago. I wanted to talk about that, but we just didn't have time to get to it, so maybe we'll do that another week. I also want to say congratulations. WDUN, Martha hosted us for a, a mini Georgia gang this week. It was so much fun. It was great to meet some of the Gainesville folks, the Gainesville voters. Um, you had some supporters. I, I you some, had some, some supporters. My people, yes. my people were up in Gainesville. <laughs> I, got, I got emotional. You did. You got two pounds towards the end. I know. It was a no, lot was of good. fun having you all up there. It was great. And look, uh, I'm just happy about all the voters. I'm happy about people getting out. And, you know, I feel this release because I haven't voted. All right. See you next week.